Hello and welcome to this family-friendly version of episode 33 of Statistically Insignificant. I have removed a lot of the Australian vernacular from this, so should you need to post it to a company board, for example, they cannot use the swearing as an excuse to remove it. Have fun. Hello and welcome to a free episode of Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with slides that's totally praxis. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and Bart is with me. How's it going, mate? I'm going well. I go by he and him. So today we're going to be talking about the relationship between wages and inflation by looking at how raises in your salary or your wage at work in the context of a high inflation environment like we're currently experiencing affect what you can actually buy. Now I'm going to put a huge warning at the top of this saying this is not financial advice. Oh, this is not financial advice because I am not legally qualified to give financial advice. This is information about statistical calculations that you would do if you had this sort of a situation going on. I'm not legally able to give financial f advice either, but I'll give it a crack. <laughs> we'll put that behind the paywall. <laughs> It's hard to think about this stuff because the value of a dollar as expressed in the number on your salary or your payslip or whatever is not the same as what you can buy with that dollar due to changes in the value of the dollar over time, right? This is what inflation is, it's the change in the value of the dollar. So a dollar in 1990 in Australia could buy roughly then what you can now buy for about $2.35 based on the inflation rate for the past 32 years. <laughs> I swear the 90s wasn't that far away. <laughs> in the same way that this applies to a dollar, it applies to your wages. To have the same salary in 2023 compared to 1990, well, you do the same calculation. To go from 1990 was $1 and in 2023 was $2.35, well you could do the, exactly the same calculation over that entire time period with a salary. I'm going to start with 50000 per year in 1990, well that's equivalent now, we have to multiply that by 235%, right, because we go from $1 to $2.35, that's a 235% increase, multiplying $50,000 per year by 235% gives you 117000 0.5 thousand per year. A $50,000 salary in 1990 was a really good salary. Now it would look like somebody who's on a comfortable six figures, let's say. $50,000 now, not nearly so salubrious. Hey, let's not be too harsh on people on this podcast, maybe, who earn just over $50,000 a year. <laughs> yeah, but you're not exactly living a life of luxury. <laughs> that is true. We're not going to be looking at how inflation is calculated in this episode. See episode 15 for details on CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, which is the typical metric used for inflation, and some of the massive problems with it. We're just going to treat it as a number that we use to do these calculations today, working as kind of a national average. What I care about for this episode with respect to inflation is that positive inflation, expressed as a percentage, means that the value of a dollar goes down, things get more expensive. So what you could buy with a dollar, you know, before this positive inflation happens, you now have to spend more than a dollar to get it. Negative inflation has the opposite effect. This is also called deflation, expressed as a percentage, as a negative percentage. So the value of a dollar is going up and things get less expensive. Usually there would not be negative, uh, like, deflation, right? That would be a very rare... Yeah, well, we actually did see it in 2020. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, the, I mean, it's not common because uh, capitalism demands growth, hmm. <laughs> but it does, like, happen occasionally, it's usually considered a disaster. Right. So, if you have zero inflation, the value of things doesn't change. What you can get for a dollar doesn't change. I'll also be really clear here, things get more expensive or things get less expensive means you need more dollars to buy the same thing or fewer dollars to buy the same thing. The thing hasn't changed. Right. And this is one of the things that makes this conversation so difficult because we, we talk about spending power, and I'll introduce a bit of terminology around this in a second, we talk about spending power in the relationship to wages and things like that. We have to either very be very, very explicit about the goods or the services that we're buying or talk about the monetary value and then do these transformations with regard to inflation. And that makes it really hard because these are relative values. 
and it's a paint try to talk about without sitting down. And I'm really glad I have a whiteboard slides, I guess, to do this with because <laughs> I cannot think about it unless I can do the calculations. The causes of inflation are complex. What we see in terms of how it's calculated is the prices of things. But the underlying causes, well, if we think about the uh, labor theory of value under capitalism, let's go real Marxist with this, right? You either have an increase in the cost of manufacturing something or providing a service, or you have an increase in profits or some combination of the two. At the moment, what we are seeing is record profits, wage stagnation. So the wages have not gone up realistically very much, but corporate profits are huge, which means that the capitalists are taking more of that monetary value out of the price of something compared to wages or whatever. Well, also commodity values have risen as well, right? That's like part of Yes, the... but the question is, so so if, if crude is selling for $100 a barrel or something like that, right? That $100 a barrel does not just reflect the amount it costs to go and get a barrel of, of, of crude oil. Certainly. Worked into that is the profit of the companies producing the oil. Commodities prices are not just a reflection of labor, they are also a reflection of what capital thinks it can charge for stuff. Yeah. Now we're going to have some terminology. Real wages or real terms is a number for a, a wage that has been adjusted for inflation. So this is the number you use if you want to compare what you're earning now to what you were earning 10 years ago or something with respect to what you can buy with it. One of the important comparisons to make here is what your baseline is, because if I'm expressing my real wages in terms of money now, that will look different to if I'm expressing my real wages with regards to money 10 years ago. So if we come back to this calculation here, this 50,000 is in the baseline of 1990 dollars. This 117, it is 100, sorry, <laughs> because I put the <laughs> decimal point there, I was about to say 117 dollars 50, but it's not. <laughs> Notation, my foe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this 117,000 dollars, it's, it's been adjusted for inflation. So that is what the 50,000 dollars is in 2023 terms. So this is the, in 2023 terms, $50,000 from 1990. Yeah. This is going to confuse me the entire way. So uh, if it confuses you as well, that's perfectly understandable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I never feel bad, don't worry. <laughs> Your nominal wage has not. So it's just the number on the page. It's just the number on the page. So in this context, we would say $50,000 is the nominal wage, and we don't attach a time to that. Right. Yeah, this is where it gets difficult, because that $50,000 is difficult to interpret when the value of the money changes. Most of what we're going to be looking at is in nominal terms, in the sense that we're going to say, what would the number have to be to keep up with inflation, be an actual raise, or be under inflation, and then a pay cut? For the purpose of this episode, we're going to be looking at annual salary. Exactly the same calculations can be done for hourly wages. It can get a little bit more complex if you are adjusting it to see what your income is over a week where you have different number of hours. So all of these calculations will be done with an annual salary. I'm going to talk about some of the complexities regarding when wet raises happen in comparison to inflation when we get to that sort of thing. So this is a somewhat simplified version of the quote unquote reality as it occurs. So I'm going to walk through a handful of simple examples. By simple, I mean we are going to look at change from one year to the next. So a single period of inflation, a single raise in salary. Then I'm going to be looking at a bunch of like multi-year calculations and we're going to show how the year to year calculation can be built into an understanding of, for example, what your salary situation is going to look like over the course of an enterprise bargaining agreement. So first of all, we're going to have a salary that stays the same with respect to purchasing power. So the salary can buy the same one year as it did the year before. Does this include things like vice taxes and stuff? Like, for example, like cigarettes rise prices pretty frequently. Yeah. I believe that that is considered in inflation statistics. Right. Because it's a, um, well, that's for, for one thing, that's a regressive tax, right? Because it it, it doesn't account for uh, different levels of income. Yeah. But that like GST would come into effect at the price point of the thing you're buying, which is where the CPI is calculated. Right. 
I am not putting taxation into any of this because that would make things entirely too annoying. Sure. Which is another reason this is not financial advice because you actually have to care about your income after tax if you're looking at it in a financial sort of situation. Yeah. I am just talking about the pre-tax income here. So what I mean by that is that this is going to increase in line with inflation. This is going to be in real terms, quote unquote, the same income. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start with 50,000. Uh, we have inflation of, let's say, 6%, because that was roughly what it was over the entirety of 2022, I think. Mm -hmm. And then our end is going to be calculated as a 6% raise on the starting income, because that's in line with inflation. So we take our 50,000 and we multiply it by 1 plus the percentage inflation expressed as a decimal, 0 0.06. So that becomes 50,000 times 1.06, which is 53,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a raise in line with inflation. And this is how you maintain your purchasing power. So rule one of, wage of wages and inflation, a raise in line with inflation means no change in what you can buy. Uh, modulo the statistical complexities of how inflation is calculated in relation to your actual purchasing habits because it's an aggregate and doesn't necessarily reflect what you personally have to pay, geographic variations, so on, right? If we take inflation to be the number that what you spend, cha that what you have to pay changes in your actual lived experience, then this is true. This also gives us a way of thinking about the difference between your inflation and your raise which is going to kind of form a groundwork for how we think about what you're missing proportionally, which is that your raise as a percentage minus inflation as a percentage tells you whether or not you're getting an actual raise in real terms or not. So in this case, this is 0%, so no change. As we will see in the next couple of examples, if this is a negative number, you are losing money. If this is a positive number, you are actually having a raise in real terms. You will be able to buy more stuff with your salary. Yeah. Example number two. In this case, we're going to have a raise below inflation. Our starting salary is also going to be 50,000. Inflation, I'm just going to shorten it like that, is going to be 6% again. But our raise is going to be 0%. This is a salary cut. So your end is going to be, again, 50,000 because you're not getting a raise here. Yeah. Let's have a look at what that calculation is. So our raise minus inflation is 0% minus 6%. So that's a 6% cut. Yeah. So this is a negative number here, and that indicates that you are losing money in real terms. Because we would need to go to $53,000 to keep in line with inflation, we've actually lost $3,000. Yeah. So the same principle applies if you have a raise that is not zero, but below inflation. So if we have instead, say, a 1% raise, so we start with our 50K, mm -hmm. we have 6% inflation, and we have 1% raise, we end up with 50500 which is still a pay cut in real terms because we're below that $53,000, which was no change. In this case, though, it's only a 5%. So this is 1% minus 6%, which is a negative 5%. Yeah. Right. So you're, you're losing money, not quite as much. So our second rule here is that a raise below inflation, I'm going to put quotation marks around that, <laughs> is a pay cut. This is really, really important if you're going into salary negotiation. If you are, for example, a union arguing for what workers should be paid in the coming year, if you are in an individual contract and you are arguing for what you should be paid, if they are not giving you a raise, that is at least inflation, they are cutting your pay. All right, in our third example, we're actually going to get a raise which is above inflation. So we're going to start with 50k again. Our inflation is 6%. Our raise is 10%. And our end salary is going to be 55,000. This is $2,000 above what it would be if it was in line with inflation. So you're getting $2,000 more than if it was just in line with inflation. So this is a genuine pay raise. And the percentage raise is 10% minus 6% is 
percent. So you're actually getting four percent more value than you were previously. Yep. So this gives us rule three. Only a raise above inflation is actually a raise. It's important here to look at both the percentage and the dollar amount. So the percentage is abstracted because it's relational. So a 5% change at the 50,000 level is radically different to a 5% change at the $200,000 level because one is four times as much. If you look at the percentage on its own, it's good to tell you proportionally what's going on, but it, it's harder to understand with regards to your everyday life. Yeah. I think that the dollar amount is also really important. I wouldn't do each one on its own though, because the dollar amount fails to account for the fact that inflation raises numbers are proportional, they are percentages. So you should look at both the change as a percentage and the actual dollar change because both of them are useful information and the dollar change is a little bit easier to interpret with respect to i go to the shops and i spend this much i would say in a collective bargaining agreement it is usually presented as a percentage but they yeah, don't yeah. they do not always present the inflation rate along with it so that you can actually make a good decision on it <laughs> funny that yeah <laughs> yeah so this is something that i am um, trying to encourage some union people I know to think about. Yeah. One of the reasons I'm doing this episode is to encourage this sort of information for people doing that bargaining. Now I'm going to add to the complexity because we need to look at multiple years. This is not just a reflection of the fact that some enterprise bargaining agreements or contracts and things last for a number of years, but also because the annual statistics around inflation, you have to look at them in totality in order to understand how your living conditions are changing over a longer period of time. One year to the next is not particularly informative with regards to your life, unless there's some sort of catastrophic event. Right. Isn't it nice? We have a nicely formatted table. <laughs> so this is our first sort of example with multiple years. This is based on Australian data. And what we see here is we go looking from 2018 to 2021, sorry, 2022, which is the year that we actually have data from. Yep. 2023 and 2024, these these are projections. So these 6.3% and 4.2%, oh, these are all percentages. Sorry, I've just written them as numbers. Yeah. That's a bit lax on my behalf. But this 6.3% and the 4.2% are what the Reserve Bank of Australia is projecting as the likely inflation rates, so the CPI inflation, for 2023 and 2024. That's where those numbers come from. How do they come to those projections? Um, oh, it's a really complex statistical model with a dosage of, shall we say, uh, governmental optimism. Because 1.2 in 2024 seems wildly optimistic. 4.2, 4 not 1.2. Oh, 4.2. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, even so, a massive drop-off from 2023 to 2024 does seem rather optimistic. Yeah, well, I have somewhere a, a graph of the RBA's projection, historical projections for like wage growth. Oh, they are fun. And boy, are they optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> this is basically a statement of what the RBA would very much like to see. Yeah. And they are going to be slamming the huge red recession button as hard as they can in order to make that number stick to a lower level, by which I mean they're going to put up mortgage rates and interest rates. Yeah. Because that's, that's the only lever that they think they have. Yes. So that's this annual CPI column. I don't have a number here for 2025 because we're going to use the 2024 number to project forward into 2025. The raise percentage is the amount you've been given as a raise, right? Yep. We're starting with a salary of $50,000. Our salary with inflation, same deal because it's the starting time. Yep. I just have to have my calculations on the other screen because otherwise I will f*** this up. So we are going to calculate your salary in 2019 based on the fact that you have a 2% raise in 2018. For the purpose of making this easier, I'm just going to assume that the raise happens at the end of the year and that all in annual inflation also happens at a point at the end of the year. It's more complex than that. This is a simplified version. So to get to your salary in 2019, this is your 50,000 times 1 plus 2%, which is 0 0.02, which is $51,000. Yep. Okay, so that is your salary per this raise. Now, the raise 
is not the same as inflation. Yes. So there's actually a gap here. The gap is 0.1%. If we go the raise with inflation, we do the same calculation, but instead of plus 0.02, it's plus 0.021. And what we get out is $51,000. And fifty dollars. So is that the number that you should have to get parity? Yes. Yeah. Okay. To maintain your purchasing power, that's the money that you should be getting. Yeah. So the gap between these is fifty dollars. This cumulative dollars is going to be. I'm going to add up over time what the person misses out on basically mm -hmm. because of the way I have aligned these. This is going to be slightly confusing. So I'm going to put the percentage gap between these two numbers here, zero point zero. Oh, sorry, 0 0.1, yep. which means that this is going to be the percentage gap between these two. Makes sense. So in 2019, there was 1.6% inflation, but you didn't get a pay rise. So that means the gap is going to be 1.6%. So your salary isn't going to change. You had zero pay rise. So you're going to have again, 51,000. Inflation being 1.6% means that we multiply 5150 by the inflation rate. So we go 51.050 times 1 plus 0.016, yep. which gives us $51,866.80. So now we have a gap between the 51,000, which is your actual salary, and the 51 866, which is what it should be if it was in line with inflation. This does come up in collective bargaining as well, because often you will get pay rises for, the, say, the first three years of a four or five year contract, yeah. but not after that point, not in the last two years of that contract. And I'm willing to bet those rises are not necessarily keeping up with inflation either. Certainly. All right. So the gap for this year is $866.80. The cumulative amount of gap is going to be 50 plus 886.80, which is going to be minus $916.80. Uh, sorry, I'll just put minus 50 here to show that we start with a $50 gap in 2019. In 2020, the gap between what we have earned in totality since 2018, and if we were in line with inflation, we've lost $1,000 roughly. Yep. On to 2021. I'm going to do exactly the same calculation. I'm not going to walk through it in such detail. So once again, we have a $0 raise, so we're still going to be at 51000 However, our inflation is actually deflation. We have negative 0.3 annual CPI, so 2020 did see deflation, which means that we're going to have 51866.8 times 1 minus 0 0.0003. I think I've got one too many zeros. Yes, I do. Paranoia is kicking in. <laughs> so this is $51,711.20. Okay, so the gap between the raise and the inflation is actually negative 0.3. For once, technically, your raise was above inflation, <laughs> because you didn't get one. But notice that your salary is still below what you should have been getting if it was in line with inflation because you didn't get a raise the previous year. Yes. So the gap for 2021 is going to be $711.20, which we add to this cumulative gap to give us, that's negative, sorry, negative $1,628. So, so far since 2018, we've lost $1,600 to this employer, yep. basically. I'm not going to write the rest in. I'm just going to jump to a slide where it's filled in, and then we're going to talk about it. Yep. So here it is in much neater, much more comprehensible notation. This is now the difference between these. Yep. But if we go down, what we can see is that these three years of no salary increase mean that in 2022, we are still earning only $51,000. Yep. If we look at the inflation in 2022, we should have been earning nearly $54,000. Mm -hmm. And we can keep going down. We don't have an annual CPI or a raise for 2025 because this has been calculated from the raise and this number. 
So this is kind of what you end up in based on the raise in 2024 is what you would get for 2025. So we can calculate these. I just haven't put in the annual CPI and the raise because I'm not calculating for 2026. Well, and assuming that the way that they're going to get inflation down is to push the big recession button, you are unlikely to get the raise presented there anyway, right? Yeah, funny that. <laughs> but let's say this is what your boss is proposing in an enterprise bargaining agreement sure. for the next three years. So what you see here is that at the end of all of this, for somebody who's been working since 2018, well, for one, none of these raises are actually above inflation. Yeah. 4.5, 4.53 are all below the inflation rate, so they all represent salary cuts in real terms. How much? Well, we can see here what the gap is, we can see here what the percentage gap is. What this person should have been on if their salary was just in line with inflation in 2025 is $63,000, yeah. which is $5,000, nearly $6,000 more than what they are being offered. And the accumulation of these losses in value over that entire period is $18,000. Yeah. This is the sort of thing that like workers have been seeing for a long time, because where salary increases have been happening is not universal. So that we're going to look at the Australian minimum wage later on, that has actually been going up pretty consistently, but a lot of people who are not on award wages have not been seeing salary increases in line with inflation yeah. as a minimum. So now we're going to have a look at an alternative proposal that your union has come out with. In this case, it's the same consumer price index, the same inflation metric because it's the same years, but what your union is proposing is that in 2022, you get a 7% raise, 2023, you get a 7% raise, and 2024, you get a 5% raise. So these are above inflation, but you've had no raise for three years. Yeah. And in that time, in totality, it has not been zero or negative inflation. Yeah. So you can do exactly the same calculations here, stepping through, calculating one year from the next with inflation, calculate the gap, and this is what you get. Now, up to here, this is exactly the same. Then we see a 70%, 70% would be amazing, 7% raise from here to here. Mm -hmm. But notice that's not enough to get you back to above the level that you should be at in line with inflation. Yes. For this particular person, their salary is still below what it should be after all of this, right? So we're seeing a $1,700 gap in 2025 between the salary they will get with the union's proposal and the actual salary they should be getting if they were to have no salary cut over the entire period of their employment. Yeah. We can have a look at these gaps as well. This is a real world, a real term increase between 2022 and 2024, but because this person has been employed for longer with nothing, it's still overall a cut. Yeah. We can also see that the cumulative loss is less, right? We were looking at 18,000 before, now it's only 10,000, 10, yeah. but it's still $10,000. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, here is an alternate list of raises that actually get you to above the amount you should have been getting if you were in line with inflation. So instead of the 775, we now have 10, 10, and 7% raises. Of course, your employer is going to squeal and never give you this, but let's be optimistic for a second. So your 10% raise from 51,000 takes you to 56,000. Another 10% raise takes you to 61,000. And a 7% raise, raise takes you to 66,000. Yep. So over this, you only are above the what you should have been at for inflation in these two years. So while on the whole, you wind up with a salary that is above the rate you would have been at with inflation, you still wind up losing a little bit of money. Well, $1,000 is a little bit over this entire like 70 year duration, right? You still wind up losing a little bit of money. It's not as much as you would have otherwise. And you actually get an, a genuine increase in these two years. Yeah. These are the sorts of numbers that you can calculate and you should be calculating if you're going to look at this sort of thing. Computations can be a bit irritating, but they are doable, right? They are a tractable problem. Yeah. The other thing to know is that businesses absolutely think in these terms because they look forward the duration of an agreement. They look at the RBA's examples. I mean, this may be less true for small businesses than it is for large ones, but these are the calculations that they do. So you should know about them and you should be able to do them, or at least know that they can be done and then find somebody who can do them for you if you need it. Absolutely. One other thing I will, I will note is that there's this funny little tradition 
where when inflation is low, workers get told that, oh, you don't need a, a raise. Your inflation is low. You're not, you're not actually like spending any more than you were previously, even if inflation is actually positive. And then when inflation gets high, businesses turn around and say, oh, we couldn't possibly give you a raise Inflation's because high. we're spending so much more money on material. <laughs> even if where that inflation is coming from is profit, not costs. All of this basically winds up being a delightful little ratchet on the experience of the worker, which just clamps down on their ability to live. And we can see this across a very long period of time, looking at these sort of calculations. One of the sorts of areas that we can see this is by looking at minimum wages. So we're going to use these as a bit of a case study in looking at how these gaps manifest, what they look like in real terms. I'm going to start with the US minimum wage because I guess it makes me the angriest, <laughs> so why not? So here is the same table, uh, sorry, it's a bit confusing because there's a lot of information immediately in front of you, from the last time that the federal minimum wage in the US got increased. So in 2009, the federal minimum wage went up $15,080 per year. Yep. This is, what, $7.25 per hour, I think is how this is calculated. And this data comes from, I think, the International Monetary Fund. There'll be a link in the references below for where you can look this up. Oh, no, it might be the OECD. Anyway, <laughs> one of them will be below with, with this data where you can go and have a look. Yeah. It's worth knowing that the website that this comes from calculates a 40-hour working week. In Australia, it's usually a 38-hour working week as standard. So just be a little bit aware of that if you are going to go and compare the sort of annual salaries in somewhere like Australia to what is cited as the minimum wage here. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. The annual CPI in the US has been typically around about 1.5%, 2% since then. 2009, because they were just coming out of the global financial crisis that they realistically never really recovered from, it was negative. But you can see how over time it's been kept like this. And this is one of the reasons that the US acting as the like global reserve currency and the petrodollar has been able to do this. It's able to moderate the local inflation to a certain point, as you can see with the 7.1% in 2022, by offsetting the inflation that it would experience to other countries that use American dollars to do global trade. What we can see with the salary is that the raise from 2009 has been 0% every year. So your $15,000 salary in 2009 is still a $15,000 13 years later. If it was to be in line with inflation, it would need to be $18,000. So there's this currently like nearly $4,000 gap between those two. And the cumulative gap over that entire period is over twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. So your typical like minimum wage American worker has lost more than a year of their salary equivalent in that time. Mm -hmm. Even in two thousand and nine, this was not really a living wage. To be perfectly realistic, right? Yeah. The fight for fifteen, which is a fifteen dollar minimum federal wage, started in twenty twelve, and a fifteen dollar wage then hourly wage would be. $18 per hour now, yeah. which is well above what this converts to, because this here converts to a $9.12 per hour hourly wage. Fight for 15 would have been double that, basically, yeah. even now. You can see from that back projection that this was not a living salary even back then, mm -hmm. and it's only gotten worse. Absolutely. I'm going to show you the Australian stuff since 2012. This is Australian data. We can see that we've had inflation between about 1 and 3 percent, 1, 2, 3% across here. Then COVID happened. Uh, so this bit here is the data we were looking at previously with that example. Yep. This salary here is the Australian federal minimum wage. This is slightly different to award wages. Yes, that's meant to be confusing because we have job specific minimums that are on top of this. Yeah. So if you work at a particular industry in a particular position, you will probably have an award wage, which is a minimum wage that applies to your particular position, which is likely to be higher than this. Yeah. But theoretically, no workers should be paid below this unless you are young or disabled. We do not talk about young or disabled people. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Here we have the federal minimum. This is based on a 38-hour week. I've converted this from 40-hour week data that I got from the OECD. And we can see that the raise percentage has been pretty consistently above 
the inflation percentage all the way down. And this is what that gap looks like. Yeah. Realistically, the minimum wage in Australia has been going up over time. The cumulative dis difference is that if you've got somebody who's been working since 2012, over that time period, they would have earned about $18,000 more than if their salary was only keeping in line with inflation. Yep. So Australian workers actually get a pretty good deal on this front. So the Fair Work Commission is the government body that actually makes these decisions. Mm -hmm. It uses Australian Bureau of Statistics data on household incomes. It uses CPI projections for inflation and things like that. But it also looks at the way that the CPI is calculated and looks at how those costs differ for people on the lowest income compared to people on higher incomes. Yep. They give about the problematic structure of the CPI in a way that <laughs> CPI numbers expressed at a federal level do not. I have some re statistical respect for the Fair Work Commission on that front because I think that this is a much better reflection of what their minimum wage objective calls a safety net of fair minimum wages than if you're just using CPI. I would say, though, that that body was put into place as a replacement for the right to strike, so I'm not going to like fully give over yes. my uh, support. As I said, some statistical respect. <laughs> when I rule the world, etc., etc., right? <laughs> they also look at things like labour productivity, business viability, gender pay gap and things because they have a mandate to try and address that. And what I mean by a gender pay gap is not just looking at women on the whole, men on the whole. Of course, they don't look at non-binary people on the whole, but that's another discussion. And saying women on the whole earn this smaller amount of money than men. They also look at specific industries because yeah. there are industries like care work that are female dominated in terms of the workforce. And shockingly, they tend to be horrendously paid. Oh, for sure. One of the problems, one of the many problems with this system is that there are specific carve outs for young people and people with disabilities. What I mean by that is that this is the adult able-bodied minimum wage. If you are young, which I think is under 18, I think is the cutoff here, you get a lower minimum wage. The um, capitalist argument for this is that it's an incentive for employers to employ young people. And boy is it, it also means <laughs> that young people get <laughs> Because it turns out that you can't show a card to show that you're underage to a landlord or a supermarket and pay less. Yeah. I mean, it also means that like there are like managers in certain jobs who are getting paid less than their uh, equivalents. Like it's like Yeah. And like the disability one is particularly galling because basically what happens is that there is a quantification of how disabled a worker is, which hmm Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we're gonna have a whole episode at least on quantifying disability at some point. I'm just trying to get a guest on for it. Yeah. And basically the reduced capacity of that worker is then applied to their wage. So if you are assessed of being fifty percent as productive as your able bodied neighbour or co-worker, you get 50% of their wage. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> this is the minimum wage objective. So that applies to this structure. The modern awards objective applies to award wages, which are the alternate structure that is job specific. These are similar, but they have also specifications for things like overtime, public holiday loadings, and those sorts of things, yeah. which have also been reduced in recent years because business doesn't like paying casuals for their unhospitable hours. All of this comes down to the fact that you can do these calculations. You have to be a little bit careful with interpreting the numbers because like these are nominal terms. Yeah. So this is expressed in twenty twenty two dollars here, in twenty twenty one dollars here, and so on. If I was to express this in twenty twelve dollars, well, this here is that calculation. So twenty nine thousand five hundred and thirty three sixty would be in twenty twelve what this is now. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, really important for workers to see this because I think that workers get told they're getting a percentage raise and think, oh, that's a raise. That means I'm getting more money. But in reality, they can't buy as much. And with rent going up in particular at the moment, they're getting screwed harder than ever. Yeah. That is everything. But thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, with that optimistic outlook, I will just got to remind our listeners that we have a Patreon. Please give us your money. 
patreon.com slash statistically insignificant where you can get bonus episodes which are out every month in fact for january is going to be on tabletop stats all right thank you very much bart see you thank later. you as ever Tess.